Hello and welcome to this, the penultimate session of day one of the IABM's BAM Live event. Thank you, Alex, for that excellent scene setting. My name is George Beaver. I'm the editor of IBC 365, and I'm your chair for this next discussion, which is at their convenience, crafting digital experiences. During this session, we want to explore and understand viewing interfaces and experiences. What are consumers' priorities when it comes to viewing film and TV online? How do they define quality? What impact has coronavirus had on viewing habits? And how have broadcasters assessed and responded to those changes to make sure that they provide the best experiences? Uh, now, the IBM has a hashtag of no digital fatigue during this online conference. Um, and I'm entirely confident that this energetic and extremely well-informed panel are gonna make sure that there's no weariness whatsoever um, even if you have watched about 785 online sessions so far this year. So let me introduce you to the panel. Uh, first up, we have Laith Wallace. Uh, Laith is Product Design Manager at Dplane, which is Discovery's soon to be rebranded on-demand service. As a UX designer and product strategist, Laith has worked with the likes of British Airways, Eurosport and Nestle. And in his current role, he leads the overall product team of UX designers, product designers, and user researchers and works with engineering, data science and content strategy teams with the aim of defining, designing and managing the process of building the Dplay design system. Hello to you, Leif. Hello. Hi, guys. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Uh, we're also joined by Annika Bidner. Annika is product owner at SVT, Sweden's national public broadcaster. Like Leif, Annika is passionate about creating great user experiences. She has a BA in communication studies and also studied cognitive science, human computer interaction, linguistics, and French. Annika has worked for SVT for seven years, and she's one of five product owners of streaming service SVT Play. Her focus is on the SVT web player, Chromecast, and Google Home. Hello to you, Annika. Hello. <laughs> and finally, we have Tanya Skoldborg Limbo. Tanya is head of NRK TV product development. With a master's degree in media science from the University of Copenhagen, Tanya worked with telco and digital agencies before moving into the streaming business in 2012 at TV2 in Norway. She's been heading up the development of Norway's public service broadcaster, NAK streaming service, NRK TV, since 2015. And hi to you, Tanya. Hi, thanks for having me. <laughs> so thank you all for joining us for this discussion. Um, and to start with, I'd like to begin with you, Leith, if I may. Um, can you give us a sense of where does a great viewer experience begin? And what are the common elements of a great experience? Yeah. So over the, over my, you know, time in the industry, I've began to realize that the more uh, a company of individuals that work within the organization can actually speak directly with customers, is the better the user experience because we're able to know directly from our users where their pain points where their problems are and exactly what they want in the product and what is feasible business-wise and technically as well within the company and the organization uh, sometimes when individuals can be detached from speaking to the actual user of the product uh, we may come up with features in our companies that seem really good to us but practically may not make the same sense to our customers but when we can speak directly with our customers, we can definitely always come up with a much better user experience. Thanks. Well, within that process, um, where, whereabouts would you say your area of expertise is, Leif? So where I specialize is fundamentally within how we can build products to scale. Uh, many a times when we're working, when I work within organizations, many times they are trying to think about how they can scale their products into new territories, into new companies, uh, or with new companies, sorry. And what I try to do is build out design systems internally to help them to do it where they can save money, where they can become more efficient and they can have a consistency across the different platforms as well as as they scale into new com new uh, territories as well. Uh, what I also like to do is work with research teams and UX designers to then take it that step further. So with our research teams, we work with our research and UXers to speak with our product managers, to speak with our product owners, to speak with the business stakeholders, to get a real good holistic understanding as to like what the business wants. And then with our researchers speaking to our users, we're able to understand what our users want as well and then combine those different, you know, 
uh, wants and needs together to look at technically what we can deliver in specific time and try and de try to deliver the best solutions within specific time frames that we have to hold to as well. Annika, during that opening video that we saw from Alex, he talked about the um, interplay between content and the user interface as well, and suggesting the importance of the user interface over the actual content that it's that it's serving up. Would, would you agree with that with that view about the the level of importance attached to the user interface versus the content? Um. No, I would say the content is always more important than the user interface. I think most of our studies have showed that uh, a great content will be viewed even if uh, uh, if the equipment is poor, so to speak. Uh, but of course, it doesn't have to be so poor that you does uh, if it's buffering too much, if it doesn't start, if it's uh, bad quality, of course, it will hinder your experience. So there's a line you you don't want to go below. And of course, you can delight people by having a lot of good features in your player. But I think the content always comes first. It has to be great. It has to be uh, uh, adapted or um, it has to be good or relevant for that person. Uh, and I think uh, we as a company, we, uh, we, we spend more time now uh, testing out content and uh, trying to fit the right content to the right user rather than working uh, of course, we work on features too, but I think we're shifting more um, towards content, the importance mm -hmm. of that. Yeah. And, and, and Tanya, um, if, if I may, I, you've been with um, with NRK um, and heading up NRK TV since uh, 2015. What, what are some of the key changes that you might have seen in the way that that service presents and serves content to people? Well, I think it's uh, mainly about um, the publishing teams and the development teams actually working really closely together to kind of uh, create new experiences where the content really can shine. And um, one of the things that we've seen is that um, back in uh, 2015, the focus was still on catch up from the linear broadcast uh, schedules. Mm -hmm. So we had a huge job to kind of uh, twist and turn um, the catalog so it became more relevant for a streaming audience. Uh, and by doing that, uh, both the publishers and, and ourselves have learned a great deal about how to actually present that in a in the nicest possible way. And I think one of the major changes has actually been that we have come to realize that uh, the product teams, the publishing teams, and uh, also the, the, the people who create the content really need to work closely together to, to succeed in this world. Leith, is that something that you're... Yeah. Leith, I was just going to say, is that something that you're experiencing at the moment with Discovery, that kind of interplay between the two teams? Yeah, correct. And one, one of the key things that's really exciting for us internally is um, uh, not only the way we move online, but understanding user behavior. So we're seeing that COVID has shot up the amount of watch time for users across all platforms. But one thing that's been exciting is to see the types of content users want from our company, the types of content users spend the most time watching, the platforms that get the most time. For example, we find bigger screens get more watch time, for example. Uh, smaller screens get more search time, for example. But what we're finding is that once we can serve through personalization, leveraging personalization, how we can serve the right content to the right users on the right platform at the right time, uh, we can then f serve a much better user experience of the whole product. Uh, and this has forced us to strategically look at new ways of presenting the deep discovery uh, brand going forward. Uh, so 2021 is mm -hmm. going to be a really, really exciting year for the company as well. Um, you, you, you touched on obviously the subject which dominates all discussions at the moment, no matter what line of work you're in um, really, which is obviously coronavirus and the impact that that's had on yeah. everything from the way that, you know, every aspect of life, including the way that we make and the way that we um, consume TV as well. Um, yeah. What sort of impact have, have you all seen in terms of viewing trends and how do you go about capturing that data um, and then using it as well in your day-to-day -day work. Off, uh, start with you maybe, Annika. 
Yeah, I have a great example of a, of a, a new uh, development there. Uh, we had a show called The Great Moose Migration, which was a slow TV production about uh, moose uh, moving around in the landscape uh, for mm -hmm. about a month. And we sent it live uh, um, from uh, different cameras uh, around uh, up in the north of Sweden. Uh, this is a natural event, so the the, the moose are moving there uh, naturally uh, at a time of year. And this uh, coincided with the corona outbreak here in Sweden. And this uh, led to a huge <laughs> watching crowd of this uh, moose, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, these moose. And we also had a great community with a chat around this where people discussing this uh, at all hours. It was great. It was heart heartwarming to read the comments. It was a, such a great event. Uh, it was lovely. So we learned a lot from that and how we can maybe create something again. Yeah. And, and Tanya, how, how about for yourself as well? Well, we saw a huge surge in the, the on-demand content. Uh, the linear uh, was growing as well, or the, the live uh, watching was growing as well, but not in the same way as the, the on-demand watching. And I think that's because people were uh, being uh, located at home and they could kind of uh, have a more free schedule during the day and actually uh, watch some of the series or content that they were watching. Um, but we had um, uh, we had some fun times with uh, um, creating a new uh, live channel uh, where that was called uh, NIK Always Together, um, where we actually uh, put in the used the cameras in the radio studios because NIK is the same is the equivalent to BBC, so we have both uh, news radio and. Uh, and, and TV to um, to so support ourselves on, and, and that worked really well with people wanting the the company. And I think that was the the same thing with the the moose experience in in, in SVT. Um, yeah. And also, yeah. we had some uh, we um, uh, the publishers uh, really discussed what kind of content would be great to to publish during that time and. Uh, usually, we've actually seen a, a dive in watching during the summertime, um, being um, public broadcasters and having you know the seasons coming in from the uh, the fall season and the spring season. We didn't see that this year, and that was also really uh, intended because we uh, um, we know that the streaming habits are changing, and uh, people want to stream. So it's not not just that volume of content, but really. The, the, the types of things that people are choosing to consume, those kind of um, shared experiences that people are very keen to to take part in. Do you yeah. do you feel that um, you've learned any lessons about the ability of your teams to to respond and react quickly during this period as well? Because I guess if you're getting these this kind of data and you're seeing the the changes in these habits, um, I just yeah. wondered if you could give us give us a sense of how you were able to respond and react to that. And whether that's changed the way that your teams approach design, rollout, implementation going forward? Well, we've actually been preparing for it for, for quite a while because we want a really f uh, flexible uh, publishing uh, uh, machine behind, if you can say that. And that comes from the work together with the, the publishers. So we kind of created the tools where we can create these kind of events and event channels uh, within hours. So it's more about the content people getting together and, and being able to do that. And also in the publishing that we have uh, the ability to uh, publish different uh, different types of content rather freely. Um, so we felt uh, pretty prepared. Uh, and mm -hmm. it's more about the creativity and then seeing how it works. So you can kind of uh, follow up each day. Okay, is this uh, channel does it have uh, does it have the growth and does it have the the loyalty? Do people trust the the things that are coming? Following that kind of things more than the the um, what can you say the product teams uh, uh, changing the way they're doing things because we're we're trying to stay ahead of the situation, not trying to react to the situation. If if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Um, and how about for you, Aniko? Is that um, has, has it changed perhaps the uh, skill sets that you might look for within your team, or what, what kind of impact? Um, 
it actually didn't impact our team so much. Uh, the player didn't change. We didn't build any new features right away. But I think it was more on the production side that they were able to yeah. quickly put together some new formats. For example, we had a home exercise show that was put together in, I think, one week. Uh, it was hugely popular. Not only old people did that, but a lot of people mm -hmm. did exercise. That I mean, people sort of realized that oh my my back is hurting. I'm sitting down too much, and it was mm -hmm. a it was a huge hit to uh, to move in, in your home. Um, and also, we had a lot of news new news formats. That uh, news was huge during this period. I think like everywhere, but we really tried to. Uh, try new new things with the news and uh, try to make a lot of new things and see how it went, like uh, Tanya said, to evaluate as we went to see what worked and what didn't work. Mm -hmm. So I think it was more on the production format side than the our technical side. And, uh, and, the, yeah. The, yeah, the and and, and for, for, for you both, Annika and Tanya, obviously coming from um, the perspective of public service broadcasters, I guess that, that point about news is, is really fundamental to, to your organisations and trust in particular, yeah. it's, you know, an ever present topic um, when we talk about public mm -hmm. service broadcasters and particularly at the moment with coronavirus as well. Um, how does that impact the way that you the way that you work? Uh, I well, think, um, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> oh, that's fine. Um, one of the things is that um, we can't go full full deep dive in, into the personalization. Uh, so uh, because the public service broadcaster has to be a community for the country. So um, when we do things, we do not want to miss uh, with people's trust to being able to watch what the um, the Norwegian population is watching, and especially news for the for the grown uh, or for for the adults uh, needs to be uh, presented in in the same way, so that people uh, do understand that they are part of uh, something larger than themselves. And um, we wouldn't want to do that kind of personalization that takes you into uh, is, uh, only that only feeds your interests if you can say that because we have uh, we are all, all built on the old uh, inform educate and, and entertain so we have to find the balance between what's really relevant for you and what uh, is uh, the the, uh, the society's needs if you can say that yeah, I think also we, we work a lot on uh, being transparent and trying to explain mm -hmm. things a lot. We have a, a, a great team that does uh, data journalism. They try to show mm -hmm. like Corona things, uh, visualize things in a different way, uh, try to explain it like in another way that you never, you didn't see it before. And we could see the effects of that in a, in a really good way. Uh, we have a measure, our, our survey that goes out, goes out maybe three times a year and they did one of those at the in the corona time and we got like trust uh 81 percent trusted sct uh, i think it's the highest number that any media company has ever gotten in sweden so it's a it's a great uh, uh, i don't know it's a great it feels great to have that during this time when sweden was really attacked from every a part of the world because we had a different strategy than everyone else but it felt great that people trusted us anyway yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Nath, when, when we spoke um earlier we touched on the subject of, of personalization um and obviously yeah. that's a can be a, a, a really essential and vital yes. um tool or part of that um mm -hmm. user experience in helping to um engage viewers even further but can it go too far? Can it be detrimental to that experience? Yeah, one thing that we are looking to, looking at is um, trying not to go too far, trying not to be so personalized in our experience and try to leverage what someone has watched before as an indicator as what they will watch in the future. Because people's tastes change with many mm. different reasons. Someone might date a new person and then they find out about a whole new different type of content and then it changes what they used to like before. Uh, I can say that with my wife, you know, um, I like action movies, but when I started to marry her, now I like home and design uh, uh, content a lot because of what she watches. 
Um, so personalization can go too far because my my Netflix ended up looking completely different to hers. Um, and that's that's the point I'm making where you have to be careful that you don't go too far. Uh, but you can definitely try your best to serve different content to different users. But the more you segment and the more you test is the better experience that you can have over time. Uh, uh, one example that we had internally was it wasn't so much on a content personalization side, but we started to adopt the mindset more of uh, problems to solve versus features to implement. So one of the problems that we had in our organization was that our users were struggling when they were trying to pay us <laughs> just in their simple payment journey, the uh, payment flow had some real challenges in it. Um, so as a UX design and research team, they went about doing the research and as this product designers, we would work with our research team to improve it, working with product and business and tech. Um, and then over a series of months, the new implementation version, one of that new implementation already uh, got 35% increase in conversions just because we are speaking to users more. So there's a real big value where, you know, trying to be too specific to a user can become detrimental, but actually speaking to customers more is really the goal that you want, irrespective of your position in the organization. Yeah. I like the idea of a shared login being the ultimate sign of, uh, your relationship progressing to a certain point as well. Um, yeah, correct. <laughs> I want to ask you now um, just about uh, in-house expertise versus outsourcing. Um, mm. And the reason, the main reason for this being, we've spoken about data and the use of data and how, how just how essential that is to, um, you know, make sure that the experience is uh, tailored and suits suits those viewers. Um, where do you draw the line between what you can achieve in-house and what you need to go out to the market for um, when you're looking at all aspects um, of the of the user experience of the design process that yep. design process that we've been speaking about? Yeah, I mean, uh, one thing that's really been helpful is uh, I don't I don't know what you both think, but uh, when it comes on to bringing like outsourcing, outsourcing really helps, especially in the beginning of a project where you just want that kind of like higher level expertise to just really get the process started. Because when you're starting a new project, it can become quite challenging to get all of the moving parts together. Uh, so it's really good to get outsourced, to get things started. But once things are started and in place, it's really good to grow in-house individuals. So we have, I have junior designers in my team who are performing at the same level as our mids and senior designers in some respects, mm -hmm. because our junior designers may not have the experience, but the level of quality that they're pushing at is really high. Why? Because we've been able to grow that talent internally. Um, and they were, that junior talent was there when the contractors were in place. So it's really helpful to grow talent internally. One, it saves the company money, but you also develop an individual at the same time, but your contractors really help to get the ball rolling when there's a lot of moving parts in the beginning. Well said. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, um, I, I think especially when you talk about the UX UI, the yeah. UX UI team, uh, it takes a long time for them to build the knowledge, uh, both about mm -hmm. the product and the publishing parts and everything. So um, buying that from outside is really not a good idea. You need to have that uh, those people in house, and um, they need to work on it there for long for a long time. And you have to grow them, as you say, Faith. Um, yeah. And also, really, some of the really complicated uh, backend systems you need to have in house as well, because it takes yes. you to kind of understand the different workflows and value streams and uh, and everything. But when you then some uh, some of the parts in between, especially for for the uh, for the app experiences and so forth, is is kind of easier to to go outside and uh, and and purchase uh, also because it's changing uh, so rapidly. Um, but we actually like to have uh, all um, all uh, kind of specialties uh, in house because a lot of the discussions that you have. Um, and a lot of the, the solution that you are uh, trying to build may actually change a lot when you have, uh, for example, an app designer uh, or an app developer being part of the discussions for the feature. 
because they can see uh, issues with the solution that the backend team or the UX UI team can't. So we really try to build what we call cross-functional teams uh, that mm -hmm. work on the different uh, uh, user needs, uh, because we also think that it's the user needs uh, and not the features that uh, needs to, to be built. And one of the examples is that we have what we call the, the discovery team, that uh, they are really focusing on how people are uh, discovering content and all the kind of pains they can have when it's really, really tiresome for people to find a new show that they want to follow. So they're really specialized in, 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 in that part. And also we have a team that's really uh, uh, focused on, on the live experiences, how you can create that kind of shared moments and, and so forth. So um, and that has been a, a change and it's actually really understandable for uh, all parts of the organization. I think um, when um, Annika and I, for example, when we need to go to the directors and so forth, it's actually easier for them to understand this too than understanding, okay, now we need to do uh, refactoring of the um, CMS, blah, de, blah, de, blah, uh, because that's just too, de too detailed for them as well. Mm -hmm. Good point. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I agree with you too, that it's really important to uh, grow uh, um, com competent people inside the company. And also it's easier for a person to learn new things than to uh, find a new one, a new person that fits in and knows everything about the company. I think also people uh, tend to like that they can uh, learn new things, they can go in new directions, and that you encourage that sharing knowledge between each other and so forth. We also have something called uh, experiment sprints that we, when we have two weeks, uh, we can do whatever we want. Uh, we can build on an idea, build the prototype and try it out. And that has been so successful in, in to start building new tools, new smart things that we can use uh, in production. For example, we have an A-B testing tool that we built ourselves. Uh, we have a, a, a recommendation engine that we use now. We also start to build on such uh, experiment, experiment sprint. So it's, it can really be go to uh, full-blown uh, production tools if you let them and if you sort of let them grow. So that's, um, I think it's a good uh, uh, idea, innovation tool. Mm. So yeah, uh, we also have consultants, of course. I think it's good to have a mix between consultants and people who stay there so you can get new ideas from outside as well. Okay. Leith, at Discovery, you use something called the Heart Framework as well. Yeah. Would, would you be able to explain that to, to um, any of the viewers who might not be familiar with it? Yeah. So we use the heart framework as a measurement of user experience. It was actually developed by Google first, and it represents happiness, engagement, adoption, retention, and task success. And we leverage the heart framework with our data analytics to basically see what users are doing on our product, how they're experiencing the product. And we use these metrics to basically inform version two and three after our MVPs are launched. So once we launch a new feature um, and we've gone through the design process that we've developed, uh, the heart framework is something that we are always using to iterate on that feature as it's launched. And it's a great way for us to measure user experience uh, across the whole product. And it really helps our product managers and product owners as well, especially our product owners. It helps our product owners to be able to justify a lot of the decisions they make to senior stakeholders because they now have analytics data and they have the user experience data to really back their decision making. So it allows them to make better decisions going forward. Cool. How do you get uh, the data? Is it a survey or? Yeah. yeah. So our researchers use a combination of tools. So sometimes they do surveys or they might do preference tests or they might do some ethnographic research. Uh, well, because of coronavirus, mm -hmm. it's a bit it's a bit challenged, challenging to do it in person as we yeah. used to, but um, they, they do a range of different surveys. Um, and then especially with like task success, sometimes we might have specific journeys. And then as a result, we'll test those journeys with key users and then see, okay, before the feature was launched, this was the success of our test base. Um, and then once it's launched, how are users uh, experiencing that, that journey that we've launched or that new feature that we've launched? And then we test it against or what we thought in our kind of initial tests. 
and then we begin to start to iterate on any challenges users are having going forward. Uh, our researchers have a range of tools that they use. Uh, one of the tools we use is a tool called uh, user, um, uh, it's a user test, user, re user zoom, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I went blank for a little bit. It's called user zoom. Uh, and that is a great research tool that the researchers are using at the moment um, to do all of our research. Cool. Yeah. Annika, have you, um, because of the restrictions, coronavirus, and perhaps the, um, less contact with, with, with viewers, either in focus groups or, or other ways that you might have been able to, to sort of gather mm -hmm. their views and information from them, have you had to look at other ways of researching and gathering that data about how they're responding to the products that you're rolling out? Yeah, we've uh, we've gone over to uh, distance testing. Uh, I think like many others, uh, mm. we still uh, recruit them the same way, but we meet them on Skype or on Google Meet or uh, the tool that they prefer. Uh, so we can we can do a lot of the testing there. Uh, we also have used surveys a lot more, um, testing out a, a new feature called uh, Clear Speech or Tydliga Tal, which is about, is about enhancing the voice in the video. We tried that out on different uh, groups, uh, for example, hard of hearing, um, that people have uh, trouble hearing uh, hearing the voices. So we, we sent the survey to their organization and they spread it among themselves and, and gave us feedback in a survey. So that, that worked really well, I think, even if it, we would have preferred to talk to them in person, but it wasn't possible. So this was an, next best way and i think we we were more creative than we used to be uh finding a way to get the the survey out to the right people and i think maybe mm. we will use that uh, more in the future as well wow mm. i like that mm. and, and tanya is it same for for you as well if you had to adjust the ways yeah. in which you're interacting with those viewers yeah, they they have to be uh, um, uh, on screen uh, as well. So um, we have uh, been searching for a new tool for that as well, and uh, been successful. And um, what's really interesting is that it seems to me that the 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 um, user experience uh, designers are actually testing more now uh, because it's easier to to set it up. And, uh, so it's actually more efficient, even though the mm -hmm. the data is not. Uh, quite as good as if you go uh, out there, but they've uh, really started to test uh, uh, also earlier in the design process, I think, to be able to adjust um, uh, more quickly. And um, But we were lucky enough that in Norway, uh, we had a huge uh, or a, um, a great summer where things went a bit more back to normal. So we uh, really dove, <laughs> dove in and had the, the yearly focus groups and uh, a lot of the qualitative uh, uh, interviews there just to make sure that we can still kind of get that uh, yeah. that knowledge because it is something different to be uh, to go and visit people at home see how they're watching tv uh, understand uh, see them using both the devices and the remotes and everything that's kind of the kids running around doing uh, other stuff and so forth too to build your understanding of uh, what the um, what the everyday life is like for for people, and there, there's a lot of uh, different scenarios. So every time we go out, we learn something new, and uh, we really look forward to uh, going out again, hopefully uh, next spring. Yeah. And so when when you say that the the the, the data is uh, perhaps different, maybe maybe not as good in an online online environment. Which which aspects of that um, are perhaps lacking compared to when you're able to meet people in person? Is it is it just people's own perception of how they view TV, the way they interact with it? Mm. Well, you can't really watch them the same way. So kind of all the body language and uh, the, all the other things that are coming in is... Um, it's quite different to uh, to to look at. It's it's um it's the same data for it. For example, if you want to test the, the click through rate and whether they understand the different uh, flows of how to to use it, that kind of usability isn't isn't really a uh, 
um, that's not an issue, but really understanding how they interact. Uh, I think there's something about being present that gives you a deep understanding of it. Um, yeah. But it's good enough and it's definitely a lot better than not doing anything. I mean, we wouldn't ever want to go back to sitting in our offices and just uh, going, yeah, maybe this is a good idea <laughs> because mm -hmm. that's not how it works. Yeah. I just want to add well, one more thing. We use Facebook groups as well to get feedback. I have a group called uh, Google Home Sweden that helped me a lot actually to uh, yeah. find the errors and comment on what worked and what didn't. And I did do that so much before, but they were really important yeah. this spring. Well, I like that. Mm. Cool. And, and Tanya, like you say, um, hopefully soon and perhaps by springtime um, you'll be able to hold these groups in person. Um, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for though. Um, so okay. it just remains for me to thank you all very much for taking part. Uh, so thank you uh, Leif, Annika and yeah. Titania as well. Um, and thank you all for watching.